you some feedback on, on how much uh, review you want. Because um, I tend I typically do too much and um, you don't I mean you don't have to go back you know too terribly far. I think, mm -hmm. I think we were doing pretty good on this. Okay, so we I'm gonna uh, go over some of the more predictions and explanations of hydroplane theory and we'll hopefully get it wrapped up uh, this evening and then we'll get started on uh, Noah's Ark and a little bit of talking about uh, feasibility of Noah's Ark there. Um, as we discussed last week, we we're interested in two major things with theories, explanatory power and um, the ability to make accurate, accurate predictions. We talked about all the things that hydroplane theory can explain. So we have a lot of explanatory power and it's a very broad um, explanations. I mean, everything from a frozen mammoth to um, craters on the moon, or even Mercury, as we're going to talk about today. Almost unifying theory. Yeah, yeah. In physics, they've been trying to find a unifying theory of physics, and they haven't quite got, got there yet. Um, some people say they're getting closer, other people say they're getting further away. I don't know. Um, but this is what we like in science. We like to have as few theories as possible to explain as, mu as much of the data as possible. We explain the origin of comets. Um, we'll talk about this when we talk about geochronographs and ways to date the age of the Earth and the solar system and the universe. Um, there's no way that our current stock of comets is going to last more than 10,000 years, probably less than that. There are more and deeper craters on the far side of the moon than the near side. Um, they tried to explain this various different ways. They couldn't quite get their minds wrapped around it. Um, they thought that the Earth shielded the near side of the moon, and yeah, it doesn't. It really doesn't. Um, so they're still at a kind of a loss to explain this. Hydroplane theory also gives us some hints about the way, the way we read our Bible. The Bible says there was no rain before the flood. And I teach physical science. We talk a lot about the rain, precipitation, and jet streams, and you know, the air rises over the lane, it cools off, adiabatic cooling, and it encounters lower pressure, it expands, you know, and the water vapor condenses out of it. Um, in order to have an earth where there's no rain, you really have to have a totally different weather pattern. And in order to have a different weather pattern, not only do you have to have a different atmosphere, you have to have a different type of land. You can't have this land, you know, like the Himalayas, 20,000, 29,000 feet above sea level uh, and have no rain. It doesn't work, okay? So hydroplane theory says, well, the earth was much more level back in those days. So you don't have massive, you know, weather systems moving. There probably weren't any tornadoes um, before Noah's flood. Probably weren't any uh, hurricanes. There was no rain at all. Um, you know, you have this gently sloping uh, land away from the sea and more than likely um, you would just have dew that condensed directly onto, onto the grass. Um, not for sure about that, I'm not a meteorologist, but that kind of gives us some ideas. Okay, well maybe that's possible. Maybe it's possible to, to build yourself an earth where it, it doesn't rain. And you just have springs and, and dew that provide all the water for the land in a much more uniform fashion. So you wouldn't have floods, you wouldn't have you know, storms, you wouldn't have hail, all the roofers would go out of business, you know. <laughs> Hope you don't mind me wearing my roofing shirt. I had some, got a roof going on today, and that's how to get home and change. So, anyway, um, in this theory, we explain where all the water came from for the flood. Right? Uh, you know, we, we talked about this first week of class. Well, you, you know, you're saying that the mountains are covered by the flood. Of course, I didn't say that. The Bible says that. So the mountains are covered by the flood. You realize Mount Everest is five and a half miles tall. You know, where are you, where are you getting the water? So you're telling me that this area of the earth is covered in five and a half miles of water? Or, you know, I guess we're, what, 1,500 feet above sea level, so a little bit less than that. No, no, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying Mount Everest used to be a lot shorter. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Mount Everest is made of sedimentary rock, pal. And there's fossils of clams buried in the rock that makes up Mount Everest. So everybody believes Mount Everest was laid or it was covered with water at some point. It's just a matter of time, right? Uh, we explain where the water went after the flood. Okay. Oh yeah, well, so the whole earth is covered with water. Where did it all go? <laughs> well, it went into very, very deep oceans. Okay. Now we have these really high continents that rose up out of the water. Um, 
we explain why we don't live to be a thousand anymore. We had some number of people that lived before the flood. We only got one pair of genes, one, one male and female, Noah and his wife. That's all the genetic material we got out of that. So, you know, if you start limiting an organism's genetic information, one of the first things that happens to them is their lifespan drops off precipitously. It, it really hits a wall. Um, they start to have all kinds of problems with arthritis and cancer and diseases and uh, you know, just all kinds of problems, right? So we don't live to be a thousand anymore, right? How is that different from Adam and Eve? Because that was just genes from two people. Right, that's what the original was. Is that before the fall? <coughs> Excuse me. So, so we gotta have perfect genetic information. We assume. Yeah, I wasn't there, but I assume it was perfect genetic information. And this is a this is another problem. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about when we get to genetics. Inbreeding inbreeding should not be a problem according to evolution. If inbreeding is a problem, what what you're saying is that mutations are a problem um, because we should be going uphill. I mean, I mean, if you if you have two people that produce offspring and then their offspring inter, intermarry, um, and we all we all know that that's a bad idea. That should not happen according to evolution. Matter of fact, Darwin married his cousin. Uh, half of his kids didn't make it past their tenth birthday. So he thought he thought that inbreeding shouldn't be a problem. That was a religious you know, nonsense, um, and it shouldn't be according to evolution. Inbreeding should not be a problem because mutations should be a net gain, but they're not. Everybody knows that. But nobody nobody puts those two things together. Anyway, so. Uh, this also explains why the flood is a one-time event. Okay? God promises never to flood the earth again. Well, he's going to keep his promise, according to the hydroplate theory. Uh, it's impossible for the flood to be earth, the earth to be flooded in that way, for the entire earth to be destroyed. Um, by the way, this allows for the entire earth to be destroyed. Right? We 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 have maybe a new appreciation for the meaning of that phrase. When God says, "I'm going to wipe everything off the face of the earth," he's serious. About now, this killed almost everything. I mean, even the fish and the whales and the, the marine reptiles and I mean the ice age that followed. It was uh, it made Mount St. Helens look like a walk in the park. So it does a lot of things theologically for us as Christians that we kind of appreciate. And we can kind of sit back. Okay, that makes this 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 theory could work for us. I think it works better than a lot of the other older theories. Classical creationists like to they they had the uh, canopy theory that the water came from the heavens um, that there was a some kind of a some of them even believed that there was a solid layer of ice or water or something above the earth uh, I just don't think that works I don't think it works physically I don't think you can get it to work that way and um, I don't think you can get enough water up there you know, for example today. Uh, today's atmosphere, you could get, if it rained all over the earth, you'd get about an inch of rain everywhere. And the atmosphere would be completely dry. All right? This provides a, a mechanism to drive that rainfall with, with all the heat coming out of the ocean, evaporations, tall continents, cold continents, all that stuff. So we really, well, I, younger creationists, really like this theory because of those reasons. We're going to go over some predictions of the hydroplate theory. Now, there's probably a hundred or more that we can get into, and a lot of them, frankly, are, are over my head. Okay, um, and this is the problem, if it is a problem, with getting your information directly from a researcher, because he doesn't know how to teach. He's just a researcher, so all of this stuff makes perfect sense to him, and he'll just go, and then this happened, and that happened, and this happened. And you're like, whoa, 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 let's slow down. How do you know that that happened? Oh, well, go read that chapter of my book, you know? And I think he's kind of, um, you know, run into that a lot. He's got a lot of amendments and, and little references in his book that you can go and, and do research on. And that's kind of the way I have to read his book. Because I'll read for a couple of paragraphs, I'm like, what? How do, you, how do you do that? And I'll go and I'll do some searches on his sources and go look up Wikipedia and see what this word means and, and, um, and those kinds of things. So we don't want to get you know, too bogged down here if we could. It's, it's fascinating stuff. Um, but, but frankly, it's, it's over most of our heads, and we, and we have the gist of it. Okay, so we're going to go over some of the uh, predictions that are maybe easier to understand, maybe more tangible, and probably more useful to us, right? If you're talking to somebody, and you're like, okay, well, you know, how do you explain water on the moon? How do you explain water on Mercury? 
um, that, that could be something that, that causes them to think, right? Something that you can use in your conversation. I mean, that's something I use in my conversations. I don't know what you guys talk about. But, um, so we predict that there should be water ice left on the moon, possibly other places in the solar system, from the eruption, and that's the key. Came from the Earth, okay? So uh, I have a little article here. And last week we looked at a, bringing my mouse to work, there we go. Greasy fingers. We got Ruthie's stuff all over. So last week we looked at um, the Wikipedia page, which is like, oh yeah, scientists have been predicting this since the 60s, which is, which is laughable, right? And this, this, this is gonna be a great experience for us to see just how their story can change sometimes. And you gotta know, you know, I tell my students, the only, thing, the only uh, subject more important than science is history. You gotta know a little bit of your history or, um, or you're not gonna figure out what's, what, what exactly is going on here. So the title of the article is from the, the Daily Mail. The uh, UK, they have better media than us. I don't know how they did that, but they do. Uh, how did water from the Earth end up on the moon? What? And this is, again, the beauty of hyperbole theory. Because these people that wrote that sentence, he has no idea. He's playing, playing around in my hands. <laughs> it's almost like I wrote the article. Uh, scientists analysis of lunar rocks find moisture identical to our own. Huh. Fascinating. Lunar rocks brought home by the astronauts contain droplets of water chemically identical to those on the Earth. So, we're looking at water inside the moon's mantle came from primitive meteorites. Well, <clears throat> I don't really believe that. We'll, we'll talk about that when we get to astrophysics. Uh, they have an analysis of lunar rocks brought back by the astronauts. The, thought, the moon is thought to have formed from a disk of debris left over. It, it lots of problems with this theory, by the way. Um, so anyway, they think that the moon formed about four and a half billion years ago. Basically, that's the take home right there. That's what they believe. All right. There it is. <laughs> Scientists have long assumed that the heat from impacts that size would cause hydrogen and other volatile elements to boil off into space, meaning that the moon should have been completely dry. Hmm. Well, they're right about this assumption. If you go blasting the surface of something with a bunch of comets or other kinds of materials, friction from the impact, energy, kinetic energy from the impact ends up getting transformed, transformed into, and well, you still have some kinetic energy left over, but a lot of heat, right? So you end up having um, enough heat to you know, melt much of the surface of the moon and when those uh, volatile elements boil off, hydrogen, water molecules, anything like that, uh, it's going to escape the moon's gravity. Right? The moon does not have enough gravity to hold on to an atmosphere, which is why it does not have an atmosphere, why Mercury doesn't have an atmosphere, why Mars doesn't have an atmosphere. They're too small. They don't have enough gravity. You have to have um, more mass to hang on to these little guys. Recently, NASA spacecraft and new research on samples from the Apollo missions have shown the moon has water, both on the surface and beneath. Uh, we have water on the moon and on the earth. It came from the same source. Simplest explanation is that there was water on the proto-earth at the time of the giant impact, and blah, blah, blah. Some of the water survived the impact. It shouldn't have, though. It shouldn't be there. Uh, they looked at melt inclusions and samples brought back. Debate rages about how the moon was formed. Oh yes, they have no answer. They've had, uh, what, two international conferences trying to figure out how the moon got there. Um, some scientists said, well, the best explanation is that uh, it's observational error, that the moon doesn't actually exist. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, they have, some, they have some serious mathematical problems with, with the moon's existence. We'll talk about that. It's, it's, quite, it's quite entertaining. But they, but they tied, yeah. Yeah, the tides and the, the moon's recession and its formation, it's just a big problem for them. Um, so, they've been carried out numerous simulations, the impact, so on and so forth. Some of the water survived the impact. Uh, research from 2011 found that melt pollution is a plenty of water, as much water as Lava forming on the Earth's ocean floor. That's what, 10, 20% water. I can't put that underneath it. What's this thing? Mm -hmm. 
studying to find the origin of the water. Well, they think it came from comets. Which again is backwards. Finding is not necessarily inconsistent with the idea that the moon was formed by a giant impact of early Earth, but it presents a problem. If the moon is made from material that came from the Earth, it makes sense that the water would share a common source. However, we still have the problem of how water was able to survive the collision. The impact somehow didn't cause all the water to be lost. Well, they should be saying, well, there, should, there wasn't an impact. They can do math. They know how much heat this would have caused, okay? They're not stupid. They're just blinded by their uh, worldview. We don't know what that process would be. Hmm. Interesting. So they're, they're all kind of scratching their heads, and they can't quite figure out um, how this water got here. Well, they have, they have various ways for the water to get there. They just don't have ways to keep the water on the um, moon until the present time. Right? And if that's not enough for you, we have water ice on Mercury. Uh, this is a analysis of the South Pole. It was taken by a messenger, the messenger probe that just got there, I think in 2011, very recently uh, discovered that in deep craters near the South Pole, we have water ice deposits on Mercury. And believe it or not, these, got, these water ice deposits have a lot of organic material in them. Hmm, I wonder where that came from. There's some analysis of the craters. These ones are near Mercury's North, North Pole. They have most water ice. Uh, let's see. Same image outline, brightness of contrast adjusted. First ever photos of water ice near Mercury's North Pole. North Pole come down to Earth. They have quite a story to tell. Surprise, given that the temperatures on the solar system's innermost planet can top 800 degrees Fahrenheit. Wow. I don't think you can get ice to survive those kinds of temperatures. 2012, you have the messenger confirmed the observations from orbit around Mercury, discovered ice in permanently shadowed craters near the planet's North Pole. Mercury has almost no tilt to its spin on its axis. Uh, let's see, this, they announced the findings after integrating results from thermal modeling studies and hydrogen hunting neutron spectrometry. Yeah, a bunch of fancy schmancy equipment. A lot to be learned by seeing the deposits. Nobody predicted this, except for maybe a couple of us. Texture of the ice at the bottom of the crater suggests the material was put in place relatively recently. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Dark deposits believed to be frozen organic rich material. Sharp boundary between the two different types. Kind of like it was blown off in chunks. Hmm. So this is a little surprising because if you have sharp boundaries there, then uh, these things are geologically young. So they haven't been mixed up by you know, later impacts and thermal conductivity and stuff like that. Yeah, they say the, the deposits on the moon are older. Um, could be because the moon has had more bombardment since then, possibly. Very interesting line of inquiry going forward. What is, what is he, British? Maybe he is British. Um, yeah, I think it's very interesting. I'd be very interested to know if it's salt water. The, the water on the moon apparently is salt water. We recently discovered that uh, there is, in fact, flowing water on Mercury, at least during the summer months. There may be 10 millimeters thick. It may be 10 meters thick. Who knows? Um, still doing some research on that. It is salt water on Mercury. It's not the same salt as we have on the Earth. It's it's mixed with chlorate and a bunch of other stuff. Mercury, or uh, I'm sorry, Mars's soil is pretty toxic. Uh, there's not there's not any dirt over there. So forget about all the problems you have with no atmosphere and you know a tiny little particle the size of a grain of sand having enough velocity to kill you. Um, there's no dirt. There's no soil. You can't. Yeah. Anyway, it's a it's a big problem. The, uh, I hope the movie gets it right. Uh, so, <laughs> craters, craters in the north and south poles, the sunlight never reaches. Yeah, this image is the south pole of Mercury, but it also has these deposits 
on the North Pole as well. Should not be there. Big surprise for um, secular scientists. Now, uh, another prediction of hydroplate theory is that there should be no fossils underneath frozen mammoth deposits. Now, this, this is a distinction here. We're talking about uh, underneath frozen mammoths, okay, um, and the muck as well. If it's just mammoth bones or mammoth fossils, actual mammoth fossils, which are rock and sedimentary rock, it's possible that those could have floated on top of um, the floodwaters. We're just, we're just talking about the muck. We're talking about muck, and we're talking about frozen mammoths. Okay, uh, so we predict that there's no sedimentary rock, no fossils, no fossil fuel. Coal, oil, natural gas, those kinds of things, beneath uh, the frozen mammoths or, or any, anywhere that there's frozen muck, you know, 1,000 feet deep, deep 2,000 feet deep, and so forth. So far, this has proven to be the case. And again, we're kind of excited, but maybe a little bit premature. We don't, we don't want to get too excited because this is a very severe test of the theory. According to initial geological maps of Siberia, there should be fossils and sedimentary rock within just a few miles of frozen mammoth defines. Okay. Now, we know more about the surface of Venus than we do about this area of the world, unfortunately. Um, it's relatively unexplored. We haven't done a lot of drilling, mostly because we're not finding oil when we do. <laughs> if we had, trust me, the Russians would uh, probably rule much more of the world than they currently do. Um, However, the accounts that we do have seem to support this idea. I think we've had two or three, if not one in here. Tolmokov, in his chapter on the geology of the Berezovka site, now this Berezovka was a, one of the best preserved frozen mammoths. We saw a picture of him a couple of weeks ago. Um, in the Berezovka site, he wrote that marine shells or marine mammals have never been discovered in deposits, in deposits having frozen mammoths. Interesting. Hern von Maydale, whoever he was, uh, I'm assuming he was male, um, reported, uh, no, no female would be stupid enough to go to Siberia, right? <laughs> it's too cold. That's only, uh, only men are dumb enough to do that. <laughs> or, um, I don't know, shall we say, as unaverse to risk. Anyway, uh, he wrote, despite my thorough search, not a single shell of fossil was found. Interesting. He's kind of expecting fossils to be found the same location, which I guess you would from an older perspective. Uh, beneath the Fairbanks Creek mammoth, sediments down to bedrock contain no marine fossils, layered strata, coal seams, or limestone. Hmm. And you can uh, look up the quote there, put my, my source there. So we've got three accounts so far, not that many. Again, we need more data here, but it certainly seems like there, there are no fossils or sedimentary rocks or anything like that underneath uh, frozen mammoth deposits or even frozen muck. This is just very interesting. So we're get, basically we're getting down to granite. You get down to the frozen mammoth, you get a little bit of frozen muck, basically some topsoil, and you're down to granite. Hmm. A very different world from today where something like 70% of the land surface of our Earth is covered <coughs> with sedimentary rock not volcanic rock. Uh, another prediction that we have some very good data on is that there should be pooled water underneath mountain ranges. It has been confirmed. And not only pooled water, but highly concentrated salt water. Interesting. Again, this is not something you would expect to find according to plate tectonics. Uh, and again, this is directly from the researchers, so you'll have to uh, forgive his scientificalness. A layer of aqueous fluids, that would be water, <laughs> could produce the conductance, that would be electrical conductivity, observed in Tibet, okay, this is underneath the Himalayas, the lower fluid fraction and or layer thickness than considered above for partial melt. Uh, for example, he uh, is estimating that a layer about 1.6 kilometers thick, which is about a mile, again, very close to what the original theory and this, again, was not discovered until very recently, check this out, the hydroplane theory's been around since the 80s, okay? Um, it's over five, actually. <laughs> uh, let's see, so, containing 10% of brine, okay, so uh, salt water, would be needed to yield the conductance. Interesting. And so he's got some good da data 
and that there does exist pretty big reserves, pretty big pools of water underneath the major mountain ranges. And again, that comes from when the, when the plates crash into each other and they crumble up. Well, there ought to be pockets of salt water left behind that uh, couldn't escape. Again, more than five miles down, you have an impermeable zone. Pressure is so great down there, you can't get water through it one way or the other. So did they drill to get this conductance reading? Uh, no, I'm not sure exactly how they got it. <laughs> uh, let's see. The detection of widespread fluids in the Tibetan crust by magneto alluric studies. Again, this is Walt Brown's book. Magneto alluric. I don't think I've ever read that before. I believe I'll go look it up. Oh, Wikipedia doesn't know what it means. <sighs> to the technical journals we go. <laughs> you know, and <laughs> it's just kind of one of those things where you know you've gotten in seriously over your head. But this guy apparently knows what he's doing. It was published in Science, which is a totally secular um, science journal. Okay, again, scientists don't have much of an imagination, okay? Uh, they name it what it is. <laughs> now, this is probably one of the most well-respected peer-reviewed journals in the world. Certainly one of the best in America. I'm so, curious what that uh, unit is to 10,000. I have no idea. <laughs> it was just as a measurement of ohms, so I'm curious right. what this is. So this is conductance, so maybe he's measuring how well it conducts rather than its electrical resistance, resistance yeah. which would be weird. But he seems to be kind of a weird fellow. I mean, obviously, I mean, wouldn't you have to be weird to go looking for pools of <laughs> salt water underneath the Himalayas? <laughs> I think you'd have to have a few, um, I don't know, a few bricks short of a load or <laughs> you, uh, you know, your elevator doesn't quite make it to the top. Every scientist is weird, right? Yeah, you, will, you won't find a scientist that's normal because they have to find this kind of thing. Fascinating! Oh, this is fascinating, Watson. Let's drill down. Well, you can't drill down through that. It's not profitable. There's no oil down there. You have to, you have to learn about this through indirect means. So you have to be really good at math. Really good at math. And the better you are at math, the worse your hair gets. You know, that's my theory, right? Einstein, Isaac Newton, you ever seen Isaac Newton's hair? It's pretty, pretty far out there, you know? Um, so anyway, uh, my, my physics professor had his hair bare grease. <laughs> it's a really cool guy, though. Anyway, so, uh, so you know, this, this is very good evidence that he has in a very well-respected science journal. I'm going to take his word for it. Because, again, he didn't expect to find it there. So I'm assuming he knows what he's talking about, which is probably not a good assumption to make. Um, but I just don't have the background to go and vet him. I have to trust you know, people who do magneto alluric studies to be able to figure out if he did his, his research right. Apparently he did, or he, or he wouldn't have had it published. So as far as we know, this is, this, you know, science is always truth as far as we know. Okay, if we can discover something you know, next week that would totally throw this out. This, is, this again, you know, this is evidence for hyperplate theory. We have lots, lots of encouraging results. There are a lot more predictions of hyperplate theory, and there remains a lot of work to be done before we can say that this theory really lived up to its claims. Okay, and again, if you read through Walter Brown's book, you're just kind of like, whoa. <laughs> you're, talking, you're talking about the Pacific Ocean just collapsing because the Atlantic is buckling up, and okay, that makes sense, but are you sure? And, you know, he's a mathematician and he's crushing the numbers. Oh yeah, this is exactly what happens, you know. Okay, uh, I'll take your word for it. You know, he makes predictions. Shallow water, water fossils should be found in the, uh, in the trenches. Well, it shouldn't be there according to plate tectonics. We have found shallow water fossils in and around ocean trenches. It shouldn't be there. Um, he even predicts that, that fossils of land creatures will be found there. We went to the Challenger Deep one time. We haven't been back since, uh, when was it, the 70s when we first went? We have never been back to the deepest place in the world. Maybe they never. found something they didn't want to report. It's possible, but more likely that they didn't want to go back. <laughs> it's expensive. Uh, it's freaky. One of the panes of glass on their uh, window broke. Man. <laughs> and they watched it break. Crack. <laughs> Whoopsie. We only have one more pane of glass. Uh, how long do you want to stay down here? <laughs> Well, there goes the ballast. I guess we'll have to go back to the surface. And they stay down there for 20 minutes. You know? And, and again, we haven't been back since. Build, just building a flipping submarine that will withstand those kinds of temperatures. 
mind-bogglingly complicated. Um, we're much better at building robots than we need to go unmanned, doing. Yeah. yeah, unmanned ones. And um, you know, Noah only gets one thousand times less money than NASA does. Their, NASA's budget for one year would fund NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Association Administration, uh, for a thousand years. They have one boat. One. And we can't even build a rocket. <laughs> well, I don't know that we need. Do we really need to know about the surface of Venus? Have we ever gotten any energy from there? Have we ever gotten any food from space? No. Nope. But we're obsessed with finding life under the ice on Europa, one of the moons of Jupiter. If we find bacteria over there, it will just enrich all of our lives so much, won't it? Econo <laughs> economically, spiritually, which ec ec ecumenically, grammatically. It would be identical to the bacteria on Earth. I think it probably would, but I don't really care. <laughs> How much, uh, let me ask you a different question. How much money are you willing to spend on it if it was your money? Okay, well, it is your money, isn't it? So wouldn't you rather figure out what's going on in the bottom of the ocean than you know where there's act we actually do get food from? Mm, yeah. uh, one third of the world's population gets most of its protein from the ocean. Y'all, you know, we we when we read history, I'm gonna get off a little, little off track here. When we read history, we are oh how could they kill all the whales? I mean, come on, that's so stupid. I mean, you've got to know that you're killing most. You know, you go from having a whaling expedition that lasts a week to having a whaling expedition that can last two years before it gets all the, its hole filled with oil, you've got to be knowing that there's not as many whales in the ocean. You're killing them off. We killed the whaling, we killed off the, off the whales until they were 1% of their original population. When we stopped whaling, it wasn't because we felt sorry for them. It wasn't because the government decided to put a stop to it. We stopped whaling because it wasn't economically feasible, feasible anymore. We stopped whaling because we discovered crude oil and it was easier to poke a hole in the ground than it was to chase these dang things all across the, con the, uh, the oceans. That's why we stopped whaling. Giant sequoia redwoods, um, thousands of feet tall, some of the largest organisms on the planet. 1% of their original domain. And we're still cutting them down in California. The Californians! are still cutting down the redwood forests. You would think at least they would understand. They don't, they don't even protect the redwood forests like they should. Bluefin tuna is now 10% of its original population. 10%. There are entire regions of the ocean where there are no fish. People say, oh, there's always more, there's more fish in the sea. There's not. We have gotten all the fish out of the sea entire huge chunks of the ocean where there are only jellyfish. I don't know if you've ever eaten jellyfish, <laughs> but I don't recommend it. <laughs> I think we need to drastically, drastically refocus re, uh, ourselves. Uh, we got all this science education about space and astronomy and all that stuff. And when's the last time you heard about a public school that offered marine biology? I teach two marine biology classes, by the way. Anyway. So we have other predictions. I'm sorry to get off on the track, off track there. I, I do that all the time. I'm infamous for it. Right? Cartwright rabbit trails. <laughs> so um, there are other predictions that have been confirmed. One is that there are deep channels under Bosporus and Gibraltar. Um, again, uh, Walter Brown is predicting that the ocean levels used to be much lower. So when these continental plates came up out of the ocean, you know, the water is draining off, and there's this deep channel underneath what today is, um, what do you call that, a strait? Uh, because, the, because the ocean level used to be much much deeper, so when it all originally drained off, well, there, there's a deep channel underneath there. He predicted that, they discovered it uh, five or six years after the fact. Uh, he's made several predictions about the size, shape, and composition of asteroids and comets. They turned out to be true. So. This is all very encouraging. Everything's pointing up. Uh, very excited about it. Very passionate about high plate theory. Um, but it's young. It's a young theory. And there's only just a, even um, creation scientists, uh, Dr. Sharp and um, Ken Hovind, and all these guys that, that are creation scientists. And I don't know if I should mention Ken Hovind. He's kind of a crazy guy. 
uh, Carl Baugh and you know guys that, that have real PhDs and are doing real good research, a lot of them just don't deal with plate tectonics. I'm sorry, with uh, hyperplate theory because they were all canopy guys. And that's the way they were trained. You can't teach an old dog new tricks, unfortunately. The questions about plate tectonics, or hyperplate theory. Okay, well we're going to move from the mechanism of the flood to Noah's Ark. That's the next in line in the Bible, so it makes sense for us to uh, study it next. Now, um, how many people in the audience have ever heard the grown-up version of Noah's Ark? Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> Isn't this kind of sad? I mean, you've heard the story <laughs> growing up, right? You had the little coloring book versions and the little precious moments characters and those those uh, VBSs that were all about Noah's Ark and all that stuff, right? I'd say uh, via Satan. Ooh. Oh, 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 better fasten your seatbelts here, folks. Um, you know, when we were doing our nursery for when Luke, when Luther was about to be born, my wife was online doing all the shopping and how we were going to decorate the, the nursery, Luther's room, and stuff like that. You can actually have a Noah-themed nursery, like Noah's Ark and the Great Flood and all the animals on the, on the Ark. And this is a picture I got from uh, searching the World Wide Web. And I, I think that's pretty typical of what's maybe in the nursery at this church. Certainly hope not. I've never seen a picture, picture or a, this is actually a mobile. Um, I've never seen anything like this in our nurseries. And if I ever did, uh, people would people would be talking about it. They would be they would be in shock at my response. I would, I would like to know what this has to do with the scriptures. Is that even close to accurate? Mm. Well, for example, uh, were zebras on the ark? Nope. I do not believe zebras on the ark were on the ark because I believe zebras, donkeys, and horses were the same kind of animal back then, and they have horizontally differentiated themselves where they all they can still interbreed, but they don't produce fertile, fertile offspring. Uh, were there lions on the ark? Nope. There were two cats. Were there ostriches on the ark? Probably not. I don't know. Some kind of ostrich-looking bird. Panda bears? Probably not. Uh, so this this horrific thing doesn't even have anything to do with science. So that's the evolved version. Well, this is uh, yeah, this is modern. These are modern day animals. Mm -hmm. Like we, uh, we would call it microevolution. We'll get to that when we start, start talking about the scale. Is silly. The scale is ridiculous, right? Yeah. Oh, we all know Noah's Ark wasn't that small. Really? <laughs> so do you ever teach to me adult the grown up version of Noah's Ark? Do you ever sit them down and say, okay, well this is how big Noah's Ark really was? Do you know how, how big Noah's Ark was? I'll take the answer in cubits or feet. I don't really care. Which, which, do you know how big it was? 150 cubits or 400 cubits? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> you don't remember? Hmm. I bet if you'd, been, if you'd learned it all growing up, you'd still remember. Which, oh, it's not important. Really? Not important, huh? Um, this is, um, well, okay. I'm not going to get into that right now. Steal my own thunder. This is something that the secular people uh, make fun of us for, right? Well, first of all, this cartoon is making out Noah to be a, a great deforester, right? You got all this deforestation that he's caused over here. And he's talking to the unicorns. He says, sorry, the horse quota is full. Ah, ah. Ah, ah, ah. Very funny. If, um, well, let me ask you this, this question. Under what circumstances is it okay to lie to kids about the Bible? Would you, would you feel differently about this if it were a different story? What if David was fighting a dwarf instead of a giant? It's possible. Yeah. But what if we depicted David fighting a dwarf in some cartoon, some children's book? Oh, we all know that Goliath was a giant. Yeah, but you just told those kids he was, a, you know, shorty. Doesn't that change the story? I mean, this thing is not even seaworthy. Come on! You got stuff poking their head over the deck. I don't like the use of the word story in the Bible. 
story. Yeah, I don't really like that either. Bible stories. We, we, and I think it's probably the language is changing on us. You know, well, we typically associate a story with something that's legend or myth or at least part way made up, right? Well, would kids be interested in the facts, though? I don't really think you should teach the Bible, all of the Bible, to small children. Should you? No. There's parts. There's parts in the Bible where there's prostitutes getting cut up and sent to. I mean, if you read the whole Bible, there's there's a part in Leviticus about what to do if your neighbor's bull falls into your pit on a Sabbath, and yeah. you know, I really don't think that's necessary to uh, well, teach to, to a three-year-old. Some of the stories to pique their interest. I yeah, I don't think I don't think Noah's Ark should be romanticized. Okay, little kids. Let me tell you about when God destroyed everything. <laughs> nah. I think you should save that for when they're about 13, 14 years old, you know, and they start getting that attitude. You, then you start teaching them about judgment. You know, we all, we, as parents, we understand that there are certain things you teach them at certain times. Right? You don't say, oh, look at Noah and all the animals. He's waving at you. Who's he waving to? Eh. Yeah. Now, this is, this is not a story for small children. No, 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 no. It loses all of its power. Do you understand there are Christians who have shipwrecked their faith over this stupid thing? <laughs> they just can't believe that he could have gotten all the animals in the earth. Well, how big was the earth? I don't know, but I don't think he could have gotten all the animals in the earth. Okay, how many animals did he take with I don't know, but he couldn't have fit. They couldn't have fit. I don't think they could have fit. I, they can't fit. <laughs> really? Well, how, why didn't he squish the two mosquitoes? Why didn't, why, why, were there dinosaurs on the ark? They start asking all these questions that they don't think you know the answer to. And unfortunately, most Christians are like, uh, I don't know, I would have squished the two mosquitoes. Completely forgetting the mosquitoes are, are taking over the world right now because it's covered in water, hello. <laughs> anyway, okay, couple of things we got to get straight here. First of all, only animals with the breath of life in their lungs are on the ark. That would be mammals, birds, reptiles. Okay? Only mammals, birds, and reptiles are on the ark. It took Noah a hundred years to build the ark and prepare for the flood. You assume he's, I don't know, storing up food and stuff like that. He was 500 years old when he started. Noah's ark is the largest wooden ship ever built. Probably. There were some of comparable size built in the 1800s. Most of them were pretty impractical. Um, one of them was actually made in order to skirt around the uh, tax on lumber. They built the whole ship and shipped it to England as a ship, and then it got taken apart and used and sold as lumber just to kind of get around the, the, the import tax. <laughs> yeah, Americans at our taxes. What are we gonna, I don't know. Anyway, they, they tried that a couple of times. One of them actually broke up and sank, which Unfortunately, as some people say, see, you can't build a, bit, a ship that big. It wouldn't be, okay, they built it for, they're trying to save money, right? Anyway. Uh, possibly Noah's Ark had the largest internal volume of any wooden ship ever built, ever. A couple of other wooden ships of a comparable size. Solano in the Wyoming. Uh, let's see, Solano was a steamboat. Uh, Wyoming was a six-masted schooner. Call it. Schooner's probably not the right word. Um, yeah, a lot of uh, mass for these bad boys. Whole dimension is 350 feet. This one's 400 some odd feet. And again, that's um, going all the way out to this little uh, Yeah, whatever you call that, spit. Sprint. Sprint. <laughs> um, dimensions for the arc using an 18 inch cubit. Okay. Dimensions are given in cubits, and cubits are the, are the length from a man's elbow to the tip of his finger, right? A Jewish cubit is 18 inches. The Jews are a little bit short, though. I'm about six feet tall. My cubit is 19 and a half inches. An Egyptian cubit was, uh, I'm lying to you here, I think it was 28 inches? They had a different cubit. They had, they had an imperial cubit, and they had a regular cubit, and yeah, is. um so there are different measurements for cubits. We're not quite sure which one we should use, but using the Jewish cubit, the ark would have been 450 feet long. 300 cubits is a measurement. Uh, it would be 45 feet tall. 
and it would be 75 feet wide. By the way, if you want to build yourself an unsinkable ship, those are some good dimensions, the ratios of length, width, and, and height to work with. Okay, so there were other ships built close to the size of the Ark. Uh, these guys were designed to carry freight, been long enough to stretch a little over one and a half football fields long. The largest of these is almost the length of the Ark, probably not having the internal volume of the Ark. This Ark was extremely stable. If you weighed it down properly, it could take a wave almost at a 90 degree angle and come out right side up. Don't know if I'd be on the on it when that happened. Uh, you have construction problems. You, listen, if you work in construction ever, you'll know that construction has problems. <laughs> okay, it doesn't matter what you're doing. If you're replacing your floor or your roof or your windows, or doesn't matter. You're going to have problems. The wood tends to shrink and expand. Um, shoot, we're having issues with code in the roofing industry right now uh, with one by eight decks because it, because wood tends to shrink and when it shrinks, it causes a shingle to break its seal and they're having problems with them leaking and it's just a mess. Um, so, it, the modern examples of large wooden ships would leak a lot, uh, both because of temperature changes and absorbing water. Wood absorbs water in expanse. So, this causes ships to have more leak problems than smaller vessels. Uh, Noah likely avoided this problem with pitch. God says pitch it inside and pitch it outside. But where did Noah get his pitch? And I thought uh, pitch was a petroleum product. Yeah, not necessarily. They also used tree sap for pitch back in the day, uh, back before they started poking holes in the ground and getting down, uh, getting it from oil. Right? So, basically, he's double waterproofing it. All right? um, this pretty much would solve his his problem completely. Keep in mind he's also using really good wood, pre-flood wood. Maybe it had, you know, higher strength than today's wood because of more consistent growing seasons. He could have used tropical wood. We don't know what gopher wood was. Um, maybe the uh, ancient Hebrews knew it. We don't. Waves can also cause problems with wooden ships, torquing the wood. So, so basically building a ship that long you know, you have waves in the ocean, they typically have a set distance between them. So, building a ship that long, you end up having this, you know, a ship this size with a wave that actually dips underneath it, so you're holding it up by the end. And again, that can cause it to torque, that can cause too much strain on it. And we have seen, hey, you know, again, ships that were built to avoid a lumber tax <laughs> by people who were cutting down the lumber, maybe not actual shipbuilders. Uh, they do or had have broken up and sunk on their maiden voyages. Uh, Noah could have conquered this problem in several ways. Two most likely being that he made his ship according to God's instructions, and also he's using antediluvian wood, which we can rationalize was probably stronger than, than modern woods. May have had trees 450 feet long. Who knows? This is Noah's Ark to scale. Uh, this is a model train. Again, this is using the Hebrew cubit. Noah's Ark could have easily been 20, 30 percent larger than this. It's like a shipping container. I know, right? <laughs> uh, let's see. This is a duckbill dinosaur. This is a sauropod dinosaur. That's Triceratops. Let's see. I got a better picture here. There's an elephant. This particular design has something called a wind rudder. And uh, wind rudders were common on ancient ships. Kept the ship pointed into the wind, and that helps it, you know, crest the waves nicely. Keeps it from getting uh, blown over by the waves. Uh, so in this model, we have elephants, we have giraffes, we've got some bales of hay over here. You can get an appreciation for how how big this thing really is. You would have been. You know, roughly, your height is equal to the width of the dot. This is a big ship. We see the window going all the way across. To read the Hebrew, that's what it indicates, that there should be a window running the entire length of the ark. Okay? We have a sealed over deck. All that stuff. Now, <clears throat> you may run into Christians these days who are otherwise perfectly normal, and yet will claim that Noah's Ark was a local flood. 
I ran into Christians at, at college all the time. Oh, it's just a local flood. Don't you know it's a local flood? Surely somebody taught you. Somebody taught you that Noah's Ark was. Do you still think it was a local flood? Okay. Well, let's sit down and talk about this. They get out their teacher voice on me. Oh boy, that didn't work so well. Local flood. Okay, I got a couple of questions for you, Einstein. Why did he build an ark? If no, okay. First of all, go read your Bible. Second of all, why is Noah building an ark? If this is just a local flood, I mean, Noah took a hundred years to build this ark. I don't know if you've ever built a boat, but it's not easy to do. Right? Some of us have. <laughs> um, why even have an ark if it's just a local flood? We're talking about a hundred years, man. But why take the animals? You're just wiping out a portion of the living things. Right? If God can speak to Noah and tell him to build an ark, he can speak to the animals and say, hey, guys, I want to get out of here by next Tuesday. Right? Just FYI. I used to take the animals. It took him a hundred years to build the ark. He can walk anywhere on earth in a hundred years. Here's a good one. Why did God promise never to flood the earth again? Mm -hmm. I did uh, Hurricane Katrina relief. Let's see, what was this back in 2000 and, was it really 2006? Wow. 2007? Well, it seemed like it was possible. Time's gone past, but um, we were working. Um, Baton Rouge and some areas, at least a couple of miles inland, and um, there was four feet of water damage in, in the attic of these houses. <laughs> Piles of trash down both sides of the streets, almost up to the roof line. Wow, that's a big flood. Yeah, big tsunami down in Indonesia a couple years later made. Katrina looked like a walk in the park. Several hundred thousand people died. God said he wouldn't flood the earth again. Made a covenant with Noah. I'll never never destroy the earth again with water. Next time I'm gonna destroy it with fire. Hmm. How do you cover mountains with a local flood? The Bible says the mountains are covered. In fact, apparently Noah was a little bit of a scientist because it says how deep the mountains were covered. So he's going over this thing. I wonder how far down that is. Drops a little line over the side. Well, what do you know? I think it's like uh, 20 cubits or something like that. How do you cover mountains? Oh, by the way, we all we have other accounts than the scriptures about ancient floods. Gilgamesh. 400 flood legends. Gilgamesh is, is a, is a well-known example of that. Uh, the Cherokee Indians had a story about, it was say a, um, well, an account, I don't know what you'd call it, one of, their, one of their pieces of history that they thought was very important about a global flood. Let's look at a couple of them. A uh, couple of things I want you to see about the graph, okay? Uh, first of all, the green square represented full, basically is completely agreeing with the biblical account, right? There's a lot of green here in this chart. The second thing I want you to see is the geographical separation of these places. We've got two Babylonian accounts, Persia, Syria, Asia Minor, Greece, Egypt, Italy, Lithuania, which is on the east coast, I'm sorry, the west coast of Russia, um, China, India, the Cree Indians in Canada. Uh, several Mexican peoples, Peru, you know Peru is mostly a desert. They have a story about a global flood in the desert that says, we have a favorite family, we have an ark that's provided, we have destruction by, okay, obviously it's going to destruct the water. Humans are saved and uh, destroyed everything. That's a pretty remarkable level of preservation for oral tradition, right? A lot of these cultures didn't have written languages. Certainly not 5,000 years ago when the flood happened. The Fiji Islands? Hawaii? Has it ever flood and cover Hawaii? They have tsunamis every once in a while. A lot of them um, seem to indicate that it was man's fault. You know, the, uh, the gods did it. Divine destruction. Um, there was one family that was saved. 
uh, for example, when when the um, pilgrims got over here, one of the main reasons why the pilgrims came, so many of them, uh, was to be evangelists, be missionaries. They wanted to witness to the the natives, right? And you can criticize their methods, but at least their hearts were in the right place. And uh, one of the first things they did was try to teach them English. And then in teaching them English, they would tell them stories from the Bible. So it's about the only book they had, right? And obviously, very important for them to know the scriptures. Well, they would uh, work their way from, from the beginning. <laughs> they didn't teach them about, um, you know, the gospel. They started at the beginning. They started at Genesis. They worked their way through Genesis. And when they got to the part about Noah's flood, the natives got very excited. Oh, we, we have that story. We know that story. And they would tell it. Oh, yes, uh, so and so. You know, the Native Americans, they, they use... Uh, Names that they just try to use every letter in the alphabet. I don't know what what it is with them, but they just that's their thing. Um, oh yeah, so and so. He was a he was a great man. He was a, he was a leader, and uh, you know the great spirit told him that he was going to bring waters over the earth. Go to this mountain. They named the highest mountain that they knew about. Go to this mountain. And so you know so and so went to this mountain and he climbed up a tall oak tree. And uh, the waters came up to the bottom of the oak tree, and then the waters came up halfway to the oak tree, and then the waters came up all the way to so-and-so's neck. But they didn't come up over his head. And then the waters went back down, and old so-and-so uh, sent out a crow. And the crow came back, and then he sent the crow out again, and the crow came back with an uh, with a uh, oak branch. And then so-and-so knew it was safe to come down from the tree, and he was the founder of our civilization. And all of us are big. We all go back to old so-and-so. And the pilgrims were like, uh, what? How do you know this story? It shouldn't surprise them, but <laughs> it's like, seriously, you know, come on, give them some credit. You know, A couple of things. You know, First of all, that's pretty impressive for oral tradition. To preserve that level of detail over thousands of years. For crying out loud, these people went to the Tower of Babel, they got their languages mixed up, they traveled thousands of miles, weathering through the Ice Age, and they still taught their kids history, and it was important enough to them to get enough details right just through memory. I mean, obviously, some of the details changed, right? It was adapted to their culture. Obviously, the names were changed, and for heaven's sake, the language changed. They didn't have TV and Xbox or even books. <laughs> yeah, you know, again, the uh, the Cree Indians, the Cherokee, did not have a written language at this time. You know, the old guy in the village, he used it, you know, what do you use your old people for? Well, their wisdom. That's where you get your wisdom from. They can't hunt anymore. They can't farm anymore. But they have the wisdom. So they knew all the stories. They teach to the kids. Pretty impressive, and and enough, and all, obviously the obvious thing about it is, this is pretty overwhelming evidence that this event actually took place. And I've had uh, I've debated Dr. Lamoureux, great guy, incredibly intelligent guy. He's like, no, Carter, you can't understand these. You know, these are all areas that flood every once in a while. That's where that, that, you know everybody would have a story about a big flood if you came from an area that flooded all the time. I'm like, wait a minute, pal. Did you miss this one here? How many times has it flooded in Peru? I mean, how silly would you have to be to teach kids about a global flood in the desert? I mean, that takes real guts, honestly. Anyway, Univer we're talking about um, universal destruction here. Everything is destroyed by these waters. Birds sent out, survivors worship. It's even some of these details are showing up. I don't know. For me, it's just too overwhelming of evidence. And, you know, these are only you know the major ones. There's lots of smaller ones. Now, I have a question for you. How many species of scientists described of animals on the Earth? Do you know? About a million. About a million species of animals on the earth. And so a lot of people, well, so you know, if Noah's taking two of every kind, 
And then he's taking two million animals on the ark. And then they're like, ah, oh, that's just ridiculous. Isn't the Bible just a bunch of fairy tales and myths? And they have a good belly laugh and they go on their merry way. Do you even know what a species is? You're exactly right, class. Scientists do not know what a species is. They are arguing amongst themselves. Oh, no, it looks like what a species is. A species is something that's reproductively isolated from other groups. Um, so, in other words, a species of something can interbreed with itself, produce, produce fertile offspring, but cannot interbreed with other groups. So you have this species, can't interbreed with that species. Well, we can agree that's a pretty good definition of a group of animals. However, there are at least seven or eight species of dogs, which can all interbreed with each other and produce fertile offspring. You have any idea how many different species of ants there are? You can't tell the difference between them. There's only, okay, this one has seven seconds in his antenna, and this one has eight. And they think they look funny, and they have different columns. Uh, but, you know, genetically, they're basically the same critter. Same thing's happening with, with larger organisms. So, a biblical kind has the same basic definition as a species. Animals reproduce after their kind, okay? But it's much broader than species. Okay, so if we go up one level, family, genus, species, okay, so species or genus is one level up from species. If we go up one level and we're just looking at mammals, birds, and reptiles, then we have approximately 16,000 animals on the earth, which may sound like an impossible number. That is a very possible number. We have intensive farms today with that many animals on them. Do you understand that uh, Americans eat 160 million chickens a week? Just Americans. <laughs> so wealthy, wealthy we really are. So um, there were some animals that took five of each. Yeah, it actually took seven. Those the seven, seven or some translations say seven pairs of the clean animals. That would be the doves, the sheep, and I think the bovines, which would be cows. Basically, like three or four different groups. They don't make a whole lot of a difference. Um, in the book, which I'm going to show you in just a minute, um, the author says, yeah, that, it makes no difference. Uh, so, if you're using genus level, mammals, birds, reptiles, you have 16,000 animals on the ark, which sounds like a lot, um, but it really is quite manageable, even with a small number of people. There were eight people on the ark, as far as we know. Uh, if you assume that it's family level, and I'm more of a, in this group here, I'm, I think. I think a biblical kind, especially back then, we'll talk more about this when we get to genetic, genetics, was much closer to a what we would call a family level. You know, the cats, the dogs, the bears, the uh, horses, equus. Okay, those are that. You start looking at families, and you start looking at what groups those are. It starts making a lot of sense. At least it does to me. Okay. So if you have a family level, you have two thousand animals. There's about a thousand families mammals, birds, and reptiles currently on the earth, including the extinct ones. Okay, that's another distinction we need to make sure we, we talk about. Okay, however, in the book, which I'll show you in just a minute, John Wood Morappi, who's the author, and he's using this number, okay, he calculates, and he's using an 18-inch cubit, he calculates without stacking the cages. He gives a certain allotment to every animal, um, and he, he uses numbers based on the amount of space you would have to allot them if you were shipping them, okay? Which is not much, <laughs> but this is an emergency situation, okay? So if you give them all that much space, floor space, and you do not stack cages, and you don't put the parakeets with the sparrows, which would be very easy to do, you know, they're both seed eaters, right? Um, without stacking the cages, without combining anybody, the animals take up approximately half of the floor space on the ark. Drops the microphone. <laughs> um, the ark is a big place, and most of these animals are not that large. When we think of animals, we think of the really cool ones, right? The ones at the zoo. Big, impressive tigers and elephants and hippos and all those giraffes. The enormous ones that are very impressive and we pay money to go see. Most animals are really small. The average size of an animal on the ark is somewhere between the size of a chicken and a sheep, depending on, it, depending on what 
stage of their life cycle you get them at. If you get juveniles, I mean, just as soon as they can possibly survive without mom and dad, it's closer to that chicken. If you're getting more teenage adult ones, closer to the size of a sheep. Okay. Half the floor space. So let's, um, this guy actually built an ark. Let's go check him out and see what, uh, what he has to say about Noah's ark. He's got his own little, um, oops. Paul the Dane Noah's ark. Let's try that. Ah, yes! There's an uh, internal picture. I don't know why it doesn't show a bigger one. You can see a bobcat in there. This is a very large structure. Where's the next external one? Uh, fine. Here we go. Here's the next one. Let's try it out. So you can see, um, uh, you know, here's a little security camera up on top of it. It has three decks, just like Noah's Ark did. Um, has adult animals in it. I don't really think Noah's like adult animals with him. Um, you, have a, you have a life-size giraffe in there. You have um, life-size elephants on the deck. And it, it's basically like a little floating uh, museum. What scale is that? Is that full scale? Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that in just a second. Let's we'll do with Thunder Man. <laughs> uh, here's, here's the uh, fully grown elephants here on the top deck. He's got a little, I think a little snack bar in there. He's got a movie theater inside here. He has, uh, he has lots of animal, stuffed animals in cages. There he is, pretty cool guy. You see a Skytrack type forklift uh, helping in construction. There's a rhinoceros again, full grown. So if you go to his website and you start looking at reviews of people that have gone through the museum and, and um, you know, seen all the stuff, I, I read through 30 or 40 of them, I couldn't take them anymore. I just couldn't stand it. Oh my gosh! It was huge! We had no idea Noah's Ark was that big! Oh my gosh, it was enormous! I had no idea! It just, it's like a broken record. It was, well, everybody said that. Every single review out of 30 or 40 people, which you would assume would be, you know, Christians who want to review this guy and give him some, you know, good props. People who actually know about Noah's Ark, you would assume this would be pretty hardcore Christians. Who would be writing this stuff? And every single one of them was totally blown away by the size. That was the thing that they took away. Can't believe how big it is. This arc is one-fifth scale. Wow. One-fifth the size of Noah's Ark. It's half the length, a third the width. Um, he had to build it the size so it would fit into a modern shipyard. He sails it all over Europe and, and does tours and stuff. Again, pretty cool. Um, but yeah, it's one fifth scale, bro. It's not the size of Noah's Ark. You'd have to have five of these things to equal the internal capacity of Noah's Ark. This ark is huge. Where are there dinosaurs on the Ark? Okay, you want the short answer or the long answer? <laughs> well, you're gonna need a little of both. Yes, there were. Come on, silly. Of course there were. Oh, well what about the Brachiosaurus? No such thing as a Brachiosaurus, right? What about the Brachiosaurus? What about the Sauropods? What about the Ultrasaurus? What about the Megasaurus? What about the Allosaurus? I mean, how do you have a, you have a carnivores? And, whoa, 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 slow down, pal. These are reptiles. Modern reptiles grow every year that they're alive. Their growth plates on their bones never seal, and they just keep growing. So a really large reptile is really old. And Noah is 600 years old when this thing hits. You think he's smart enough not to take the biggest one that he can find? I mean, come on. The, the biggest reptile egg we've ever found is about the size of American football. As soon as they hatch out, they're ready to go. The reptiles. They're pre uh, everything they need to know is programmed into their little brains. They do have little brains. No offense, reptiles. <laughs> Dinosaurs are actually pretty easy to get on the ark. Not gonna lie. This is kind of a pathetic question. Yes, there were dinosaurs on the ark. No, they were not extinct. There were only about 50 different kinds. The largest dinosaur egg we've ever found 
pretty easy to manage. They have low metabolism, at least today, they have low metabolisms. We don't want extremely old, extremely large reptiles on the earth. I mean, come on! You go out and find a group of uh, brachiosaurs, and you're gonna go, all right, let's get the two-ton animal, we're gonna put him on the butt. One false step, he'll sink the whole expedition! I mean, probably not. I let people ask me how to get the whales on the ark. Oh my gosh. Um, the whole earth is covered with water. Did you miss something here? There are a lot of whales that died in the flood. Don't get me wrong. But they swim in the water. They do. They, they do quite well in it. Uh, so we don't want extremely old, extremely large reptiles in the ark. Um, much, much less of a challenge than the large mammals. Okay, you can take the juveniles. You, they don't eat as much, they don't poop as much, they sleep more. It, it's hilariously easy to do this. Okay? There are other questions people have. Well, did you know, did you know that polar bears only eat seal fat? So what, did Noah have a population of seals? He's feeding the polar bears? Okay, first of all, you're wrong. Polar bears eat all kinds of stuff besides seal blubber. We used to think they only ate seal blubber because it's the only thing we've ever seen them eat. They actually will eat the entire seal. If you stay and watch, they eat the fat first because you would too. Anyway, <laughs> don't, don't get me started, Americans. <laughs> Guilty. Guilty as charged. Um, they, they eat all kinds of stuff. In fact, zoos have kept polar bears alive on a diet of almost 100% grain for over a year. Modern polar bears. We have polar bears that are interbreeding with the uh, grizzly bears because there are so many polar bears now, right? Al Gore, when Al Gore was born, there were only, uh, there were, um, let's see what, uh, I'm trying to find the right number, I think it was 7,000 polar bears on the earth, and today only 27,000 of them remain, right? <laughs> Some estimates up to 40,000. They're doing quite well. Whatever this global warming stuff is, which I don't think it's not a big deal. They're loving it. They are just loving it up there. Um, but their, their, their population is getting so huge, they're interbreeding with grizzly bears and making pizzly bears. <laughs> so I think it's pretty obvious that these guys are the same kind of animal. <clears throat> and grizzly bears will eat anything. They eat grass. Yeah, they do. They, they actually get protein, a lot of protein from sedge grass or something up there. And uh, uh, they love it. They eat it like a cow. It's really, really disturbing. Anyway. Um, what about a vampire bat? Vampire bats only eat the blood of vertebrates. Again, okay, it probably has micro-evolved in the five or six thousand years since the most flood. Um, you know, I, I doubt Noah would have put up with that kind of nonsense. It's still <laughs> sip from the cows and some of Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they don't really cause much damage. I mean, you could certainly argue that they were on the ark and just blood them out every once in a while. I mean, uh, you know, personally, I would have killed them. Like, Sorry, God. Pow! Get my shovel out. Maybe, maybe Noah did that with some of the animals. He's kind of decided, don't think I want any one of these things. Say we're too tigers. No, 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 no. No, that's a bad idea. Anyway, uh, how do you get all the poop off of here? What about waste disposal? I worked for two years in a stable, a horse stable, groomed four world champion horses. We had um, 20 to 27 head of horses at any given time. They made a lot of poop, I'm telling you. Worked with some half draft horses, about yay tall at the shoulder, and uh, man, um, I spent a lot of time shoveling horse poop. That was my job description. I got pretty good at it, actually. Learned everything there is to know about it. Um, you know, we do a very, very labor-intensive uh, waste disposal method. We these are show animals, right? They're they're worth tens of thousands of dollars. They're their owners have very sensitive noses, and, and um, we want them to smell nice, and we spend a lot of money keeping them, and zoos, same thing. They spend a lot of money keeping them clean, keeping them presentable, keeping, you know, our delicate American senses from being offended, right? Ever been to a uh, cow farm? Ever been to a feedlot? You ever been to a pig farm? <laughs> I will guarantee flipping to you, you can smell it before you can see it. Guarantee you. I mean, your sense of smell is kind of pathetic. Humans, very short noses. Very good. Most animals. Um, 
gosh, when I, when I worked up in Nebraska, man, you could smell a feedlot miles away. They really don't dispose of the waste. They just let it do its thing. And it's bad for the animals. It's not the best. Um, most American feedlots lack even the most basic labor-saving devices. And just don't use them. I don't know why. Uh, ventilation is a piece of cake. You got heat from coming from the animals and circulates until heat right, hot air rises. And um, you got the window there. It, it, that's fine. Water, you can carry it in barrels on the ark, which would be very difficult. More likely it was pumped in from outside the ark. Wasn't it salt water? Oh, well, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. Um, probably no one took a lot of water on the ark. This is actually a good question. That's actually a little bit of a challenge to get all the water on there. Okay, but we know, uh, we know of. Um, Water pumps that date back to Egyptian times. I'm crying out loud. But the what is it called? The Shadoof. I forget what it's called. But yeah, they knew about water pumps way, way, way back in time. And they also knew about something we call um, slotted flooring. We're going to skip through all this stuff. This is a long PowerPoint. Okay, so we get into a summary of, of uh, the book. Now again, I like to use I don't like to use books that are difficult to get a hold of or out of print. And this book was out of print for a while, and there were copies of it selling for like 150 bucks. And um, I was afraid they weren't going to make any more. And apparently, I sparked a bunch of interest in this. I'm going to take some credit for this. <laughs> um, uh, you can buy this book for 15 bucks. If you have any respect for anything I say or my opinion about anything, you. You have to have one of these books. You have to have it. If you got a Bible, that's the first most important book for you to have. Second is this book. You got kids running around the house, they got questions about Noah's Ark, you need this book. I have I have my own copy. I need to get like five of them. Um, I loaned it to one of my uh, college professors who, no one could possibly go all the animals there. Oh, yes, he could have. No, he couldn't have. Yes, he could have. How do you know he couldn't get up? Oh, the ark, the ark was big enough. How big was the ark? Oh, then she got mad. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember. It was not big enough. <laughs> How many animals were there? Well, there's too many species. Oh, my gosh. All right. Read the book. Read the book, then we'll talk. She never read it. I read a review about it. I, oh, my gosh. Wow. Anyway. Anyway, get yourself one of these things. Does that disturb you? Is the lack of curiosity? And it's, it's it's beyond disturbing to me. I think it's fascinating. <laughs> I I don't have a choice. I can either be in despair that um, these people are gone forever and they can't be educated, or I can be fascinated that people can be so sure of their philosophy that. They just won't believe. There, there are scientists who say it doesn't matter what the data says. Um, creation is ruled out because it's not a scientific explanation. I mean, that's, that, that's their philosophy. That's their worldview. They only draw from that one source of truth and everything else is subservient to it. They're narrow-minded. They're immature. They're whatever you want to call them. But they're uh, not to be trusted. No trust them as far as you can throw them. I can throw them a couple hundred yards, but I don't know how much <laughs> trust them that far. Okay, so get yourself one of these books. Noah's Ark Feasibility Study. It's great. I'm going to have a little summary here. Talk about some of these chapters. Uh, the first chapter is the most important. Um, so, um, John Wood Murapi studies, uh, states his rationale that there's only mammals, birds, and reptiles in the ark. He does a study of the Hebrew. Um, he includes dinosaurs, he includes marine birds, um, he includes many species of mammals and reptiles that are or possibly could have been completely aquatic, you know, like alligators. They, they survive very well in the water for long periods, long periods of time. Some of the larger ones may never come ashore, we think. We're just learning this. But anyway, um, he argues there are no unknown animals to speak of, right? We got fossils, basically everything. We haven't discovered a new species, or certainly not a new kind of animal in decades. So we know about all of them. Incredibly, incredibly rare. He argues that um, he 
he argues that the topographic or the taxonomic rank should be family. Okay. He has lots of really good persuasion in his book that the biblical created kind is the same as the family is today. Okay. Provides ample evidence for that, but he does all of his calculations assuming it's equivalent to genus level. So he takes a whole taxonomic rank worth of error margin. Now that's pretty impressive. Still makes the whole thing work. 2,000 animals is pretty easy to get on the ark. If you use genus level, about 16,000 animals on the ark, that's more difficult to do. Chapter 2 is about how much floor space you need. Approximately 46.8% 4, of the ark's floor space would have been used by the animals in without stacking their cages. So a lot of their food is stored near them, or actually maybe even possibly in their cages. Uh, you have lots of space for aisles and things like that. Obviously, you're going to stack some of their cages up. I mean, that's we do that today, right? Mm -hmm. Food and water storage would have been actually a bigger problem than getting all the animals on there. Um, it is perfectly possible to keep almost all kinds of zoo animals on diets consisting of almost entirely of grain. This whole idea that you have to mimic their natural diet, that's what's most healthy for them. It probably is most healthy for them, but it's not necessary. The ark is 300, or the, um, the flood is 380 days. Okay. And this is to say that God put them them in some kind of a hibernation state. John Wilmerabi uh, assumes that this is completely Noah. Doesn't doesn't allow for any miracle at all. Which again, you know, we we, we think of I mean, we know of a lot of miracles um, in the scriptures. So he says food that was probably used. You have lots of hay pellets. Again, this technology goes way back in history. Lots of seeds and grains. You have dried fruits, meats, and fish being rarer. Obviously, he could have fished off the side of the earth. I'm not sure he did. Total volume of the ark used for this is probably about 25%. Water can be pumped on board, stored in barrels. How do you get rid of waste? Talk about some of this stuff. Uh, you know, something like this. Just allow the waste to accumulate. You don't have to dispose of it. It's not really dangerous. Um, one of the things that John Woodbright talks about is uh, something called vermicomposting. Which again, is a word I'd never heard before. <laughs> I read the book, vermicomposting. You know, if you've got a nice population of earthworms, basically they'll eat this stuff. They love it. And you can use the earthworms to, to feed. I mean, even tigers will eat earthworms. Or you can fish for them. Yeah, that's <laughs> live bait. <laughs> you got yourself a, um, a ready source. You made food with food, right? You're confusing the food with what my food eats, right? <laughs> so we do this with rabbits all the time. Right? especially small operations. Larger feedlot type work, this is a dairy farm, um, but larger operations also oftentimes have a lot of floors and there's a little slanted area down here that collects the waste and you run a little water down it. You know, waste from the animals is like 87% water anyway. Just flow downhill. It's not that big of a problem. You can even allow it to accumulate. Again, vermicomposted. Um, not a big deal. The big deal with the ark. The real question why was it so freaking big? It was huge. Way bigger than it needed to be. We're almost positive that a biblical created kind is equal to a family level. 2,000 animals on the ark, you're using up a tiny fraction of the floor space. Might be more stable than longer because it would span more waves. Sure. I think this is possible. You can build stable boats a lot smaller, though. No one put a lot of effort into this thing. I think the ark was so big because it's uh, an example of God's grace. It's obvious to me, having studied this, obvious to me, and Wooden Rape and Wooden Rappy, however you say his name, and a lot of other guys that have studied this in some detail, that the ark is way too big and that there could have been a lot more than eight people that got on it. A lot more. You can do some studies of population dynamics and figure out that there could have been two or three million people on the planet this time, easily. Maybe a lot more than that. You know, make some assumptions. How many kids do they have? You know, they live to be a thousand. They could have a lot of kids. Could have. Uh, probably didn't have, you know, a hundred kids apiece, but um, could have. 
really could have. So being conservative, you get two or three million people on the planet at this time. Could have been a lot more than eight people on this boat, but there weren't. <laughs> 380 days. <laughs> there was only the eight people. <coughs> God allowed for more people, but they didn't come. He called them. They didn't listen. Noah preached for a hundred years. They all died in the flood. Yeah. Except for a few. We'll talk about that next week. All right. <laughs> we'll uh, we'll get into uh, some more stuff about humans in the fossil record. Next week, we'll, still, we'll uh, talk about. It. We'll get into the fossil record and get into some, some stuff about uh, human, human remains. And fossil Any questions?